from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Lucas and Roddenberry franchises, the Martian Chronicles, and beyond. Science fiction is undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions. And we appear. So, Adam, hit the V button, bring your camera into view, and oh, I've got, it's just the boys today on creating. Love. <laughs> that's right, that's right. What is Kate, Caitlin up to today? Uh, she is, I believe, meeting with a longtime friend, and then they go and they spend the day together, and they just, just kind of re-energize and reset. So, More of a personal day, and so good for yeah, her. Well, yeah, well, it's a break, I think. You know, as, as you know, as entrepreneurs, breaks are few and far between, so we cherish them when we have them. <laughs> so. I think there can be some wisdom in that. And someone says, you know, we're not so much on a schedule, so if, if, if the break needs to happen at 3 in the afternoon and your next appointment's not till 5, then, you know, you just kind of snag it and you know, work into the evening and, you know, we know there's no set hours for evenings, yeah. weekends and stuff like that. Right. So yeah, I've full on like rarely, but there's been the odd time when I've been exhausted. It's been like one o'clock and been like, I need to have like a 20 minute nap. <laughs> I'm not functioning right now. This, this is pointless or walk the dog or whatever. Right. So yeah. Um, but so. Um, Anyways, let's get let's get into the in, into the book. I'm excited uh, to hear what the you know what you're thinking about. And uh, were you developing a new uh, um, a portion of the book, or were you? Just yeah, kind of so it was kind of playing where we went from last time, right? We plugged into the flow, and I was trying to imagine like what could that be like, right? And I talked a little bit last time about it maybe being different for every person, you know, what which senses are amplified, which are not. And then I thought about this idea of synthesia. I think I don't know if I said it right. You know, where you you see sounds, or you know, there that's a um, well documented um, thing. So I, I thought, wouldn't that also be cool? Like, when, to add the disorientation, right? You're you're seeing things you might normally hear, and vice versa, and it's just kind of crazy. But I kind of left it as, here we go. We're going to enter this world and imagine a world where you're not constrained by you know, the human eye, I looked this up, has 135 horizontal degree field of view and about 180 vertical. Now, if you don't have eyeballs, if you don't have a physical body, then you're not constrained by that. So you're, what you're looking at, you could see 360 degrees all at once if you're just sensing what's going on. <laughs> right? So I was like, okay, <laughs> that's pretty crazy. But then I said, well... Uh, anyway, I'll read you what I have. Can I, can, I, can I pause you there? Because the technology of that is something, as a philosopher, I was very interested in, in that cone-shaped apparatus of our of our uh, dominating visual sense, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you take one particular sense that defines humanity, I mean, this is, it's it, it's kind of arbitrary, but it, it because there's no division, right? The, you know, the other senses do affect your, 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 your vision as well. But... It, it does seem to me that 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 visual sense is the most um, uh, relied upon, and in, in in a hierarchy, it's right up at the top of mm -hmm. of our senses, right? And there is a a very unique kind of um, uh, you know cone shape uh, receiving uh, funnel, I guess, of of mm -hmm. information flow, and it it matches exactly what you said of that aspect oh. ratio of one hundred and thirty by I think 180 degrees, right? And mm -hmm. the only option may not be 360. Um, you know, it may be various different things, but yeah, I like, I really like where you're going with this. Yeah, yeah it's cool. Like, I, what, I, what I enjoy about this process is um, it's not like I thought about this really hard or planned it out. I just started kind of imagining and writing things, and I realized, like, okay, well, it would have to be like this, right? Like, what? What, kind, what would it imagine, right? You know, and this is the world we're building. We'll get to the plot moving forward, but first I have to make sure that you are viscerally experiencing this. So, um, 
Anyway, Harry, check this out. I didn't get a lot done, but I think it's a cool little piece here. Okay. Um, okay, I'm just going to read it, and then we'll, we'll go. Um, okay. Here we go. The sensation of following is really just my mind attempting to make sense of the rapidly expanding information flow that my mind is connected to. My exterior world expands rapidly outwards, which my mind interprets as me falling into the flow. Either way, one mode in my world is only as big as my eyes can see, the next it is seemingly infinite. Information packets that I perceive as light impulses flood my brain and for a moment I revel in it. It's like standing in the sun after a day of rain and just bathing in the warmth. I love it. Here in the flow, I'm not limited to 135 degree field of view because of where my eyeballs are situated. I see in all directions. In fact, if I really think about it, there are no directions here, but that makes my head hurt. At some point, I have to ground myself in something familiar, and for that, I need to decide which way is down. A cluster of light explodes to my left. These are inquiries, questions, notes, and with a thought, I prioritize those, and they fill my view, blocking out everything else. Appointment reminder for today at 2 p.m. Universal Soul Time. Flow content released for approval. Proposal received. Please review. Credit deposit notification. Personnel issue for your information. I address them one by one. This goes quickly without the hindrance of any physical devices. My responses are simply thoughts that are transcribed automatically into response that can be interpreted and sent away. I pause on the personnel issue, however. These bother me. Typically at the leadership level of a large organization, artful intelligence handles these issues. People of an organization can be thought of as nodes in a web of flow. If a node is not performing, the AI construct dismisses the node and restructures, forming new links and optimizing roles and requirements. I bring up my organizational web for a moment. I call it a web, but I always thought that once it gets large enough and complex enough, it looks more like its own universe. Individual nodes are small points of light, while the strands of blue-red energy connecting them flicker like the synapses of a brain. The higher performers are obvious as those stars are larger and brighter. More information is flowing through them than they show as hubs or wells of light impacting the web around them. It is fascinating to me how information can behave the same as physical forces like gravity. A small flicker of light drops off like a shooting star. Reminder to search pages and papers on informational gravity. And that's where I left it. Oh, wow. Okay. I want you to go back to the, the first sentence where you decide that you want to focus your baseline on down. Can, can you repeat yeah. that? Uh, at some point, I have to ground myself in something familiar, and for that, I need to decide which way is down. So, can you, <laughs> so you, you want to be a little bit cheeky or tongue in cheek? You can say, um, and and this is when the gravity of the situation is revealed. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, how arbitrary is down if you're on a spaceship or even, a, you know, as we're, you know, corkscrewing through space, um, right. you know, we really realize that there's no real down. But the relative down, um, I guess, functionally really has to do with our proximity, uh, you, know, you know, to a, bo a mass, a body of mass, uh, you know. Um, you know, so in, on Earth, we've got you know, the Earth. Yeah, and like, <laughs> right? that's, that's kind of cool. I mean, I could stand, because, you know, I thought about this idea of informational gravity, right? I imagined, like, if if people working together in an organization are, like, nodes, and if you could represent that as, like, nodes of light, the people yeah. who do the best are the ones that are able to um, flow more information through them in this scenario. So I pictured almost right. like like a star creating a, a like a dent or a a well in this web, just like gravity. And um, you know, the more information you have coming coming at you, maybe that's how you orientate yourself. There's no physical down. There's just like denser information, so that becomes down. <laughs> Something like that. No, 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 no. I'm totally with you. But I mean, this is this could even be a scientific form of transcendentalism, right? Because you can mm. you can take if you have a direction of down, you have a direction of up. The yeah. direction of up is actually an imagined space, and so we can't tangibly touch or feel information. Well, no, we can feel the significance of the semantics of. This is what I needed a reference point to describe what happened. I need to be able to say the lights to my left. You know, mm -hmm. so visual. There's stuff to my right. There's stuff above me. Whatever. 
And I just feel like as humans, even in this type of space, our brains would try and simulate something familiar, right? Like, oh, absolutely. Um, I, 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 I fully agree. And, and Adam, I think it's at a, I, I, it's just the vein that you're going with the information piece. It's definitely something that's, you know, part of my thinking as a philosopher. Um, I've, I've, let's stay there on the information then. So um, information flow. Very, very interesting. And uh, as an engineer, you might also, uh, here's the thing, is that if I was designing something that could optimize that to tell us with real empirical information, something mm -hmm. that would, um, I guess, uh, give us a feedback in real time, okay? Right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that we could we could turn it into a different meaning or extrapolate upon it, or but to have that information flow it, it's very interesting and revealing, okay? And and one of the things that you could focus on is is the change, the relative change. It's not because it's such a, um, there would be such a, um, a a flux or a delta T, a delta in, 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 in that information type of thing, right? And physiologically, we talked about it earlier. I mean, Adam hits a wall, needs to go have a nap. It's like, it slows down to nothing and then all the benefits of sleep which really uh, as far as sleep studies now are are really about um, you know cleansing that that sensory input apparatus for receiving information it really cleanses it because and, and what an evolutionary adaptation for a mammal right I mean how amazing is that that we actually go into a state of non-conscious, awareness because we're sleeping right i i just i i it's just so unique to talk about that and then you know how how you can how you can change that or how we change naturally or you know in the future right yeah this is you know as i start to like imagine this in the context of the story we're trying to say right you know if you've got something that's con constantly malleable and optimizing this with this web so to speak then it, it doesn't really like disruption, something like that, right? So the odd outlier that starts to build a connection in the wrong direction or, you know, wrong or whatever, it might just get disconnected, right? Where this, this is where like the Elon Musks of the world would just get, you know, pushed away. And I think this is the point of the point of where, one of the points we're trying to make in our book is that sometimes, you know, uh, something seemingly wrong could be incredibly right. You know, yeah. one node going in the right direction, the rest going in the same direction, like, you know, so um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure where, where it's going to evolve to, but I thought that was super cool. I kind of pictured, like, if you're watching a movie and you saw this, like, how cool would that be to be able to see people that you worked with represented like this? And you'd be like, oh, look, look at these two people. They're like, you know, because you're the best people that you work with whether it's at work or personally, whatever, they have like a gravity to them, right? We actually say that, right? They walk into the room and everybody kind of turns and looks, right? There's a there's an energy to them or something, right? Um, yeah. Um, anyway, this is, this is why I love doing this as a sci-fi. Oh, how much more fun is this than, uh, than um, you know, just doing something normal? I haven't really enjoyed it. Well, it... it I think that um, conjecture and speculation are uh, foundational to a creative process, right? I mean, um, you know, there's nothing saying that, that, you know, the entirety that is this novel is a dogmatic uh, representation of an absolute, the way the, the world functions. I think one of the, the good things about science fiction is that you can take something run with it to its natural conclusions and then show society, the reader, uh, a, a reflection of, of something that is humane or something that is revealing either of our uh, current time or the human condition. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, uh, I think you've got a lot of good um, intuitions when it comes to that. Cool. Well, thank you. And yeah. We, you know, where, what I want to go next is, you know, okay, I have this world, I want to just kind of explore what a day is like or perceive, you know, on the course where you get to the point where um, 
character is going to be notified that they should sleep, right? Or that they should unplug. And he's going to ignore that and ignore that and ignore that and that's going to cause some issues, right? But um, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to kind of live in here a little bit. What would a day look like in this crazy space? How would you take a break? What would you do? You, you know, I, I don't know. Like, um, yeah, it's kind of fun just to uh, see see what the mind can invent here. I'm going to. Did you ever take the um, the passive filter test with your? Um, let's see here. Because I created a lot of these, this type of um, like nodal superstructures for new writers that were coming in, in into Planksa. Oh, and okay. yeah, like I graphically. Uh, so I wanted to show you one that I did for a professor okay. here. Let's see yeah. if I can can find it. Can you carry the? The conversation just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, about where you're going? I have to put some dedicated thinking into finding this this email. Yeah, but. no, I think um, I didn't do it last week, but I want to send you. I'll find some pictures and videos. I think this would make for a cool one of those like inspirational videos where we um, record the voice talking over uh, some videos. Help you imagine it. I'll definitely do that for this piece. Um, yeah, I just, I, I think this part is important. I want people to read that and be like, holy oh, crap, I never thought of that. Or like, that is really epic. <laughs> you know, this is cool. I, you know, I want to draw people in uh, by making them think about big thoughts in um, sneaky ways, right? Maybe not come out and say that we're make, talking about transcendental philosophy or whatever, but that we're, um, you know, just going to show what happens here so I mean, i'm quite i'm quite liking it all right so i'm going to i'm going to share my screen i don't hopefully this is good for everybody to see but here's a um okay so here's the uh the back oh no this is um this is uh, assignments for Stephen Tobinak. It's not really assignments. He never he never did the assignments, but mm -hmm. um, other writers come on and they gave their top seven to to twenty five top thinkers, right? Okay. And these are ones from intuition to say, you know, Adam, who are your top twenty five thinkers? And then his, for example, were um, you know Dante and Hegel and you know there's some Marxist thinkers in here and some famous philosophers and you know, this type of thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, there's the corresponding books. We created a, um, a, 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 a spreadsheet for that, which we've got here. And you'll see that we've got instances, quotes, but there's, you know, there's quite a procedure here. And then graphically what it looks like yeah. is, um, like this. Okay. So, You'll see that the nodes, does Holy this make crap. sense? Yeah. yeah. So, we, so we have a, a statistical modeling program that we use, and we can see where things start to cluster. Yeah. And so, and then proximity. And, you know, it's it's very interesting to us that, you know, we have a, who's this one here? Yeah, that's kind of exactly what I was picturing. You can see where it gets denser, right? Exactly. And um, so we work with this kind of thing. And that, that that's um, very interesting for me um, as a philosopher. Now, I'll stop sharing because that's basically all I wanted to show you that we um, we're, we're doing that actually on an ongoing basis. Um, and the idea for this is that I, I wanted to create a... Um, a, a relatively um, arbitrary um, uh, 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 reference point or baseline control. Okay, the, mm -hmm. there's nothing in this in, in this co correlative relationship that's saying that it's there's any causation to this type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, because this is the biggest pushback that when I start to work in in databases and I start to show this beyond the novel clustering that we have, we try and say, well, what can we extrapolate from these the proximity of these uh, relationships, right? And when you have it and um, uh, when you use this as a, a a 
content creation map and a, a personalized, um, I guess, representation of where where someone's um, knowledge drifts, like where their preferences are in terms of favorite mm -hmm. authors, then you can actually compare these maps to other people's maps and see where maybe some opportunities lie, where some blind spots are, uh, where some blind spots are related from say Adam to like, you know, the rest of society, for example. Right. And yeah. And, and then the other use of it was that um, we use that as a propagation model, or we do use it as propagation models for uh, content creation. Um, mm -hmm. And when I was writing my book, Will Freeman, um, it was this kind of correlative uh, infrastructure of information uh, um, gatherings or you know, gravity clusters that you would actually uh, see form her neural net, right? This is, this is how her mind develops, except for it's not an individual, it's, it's the collective wisdom of humanity. And that's why um, a battle from, you know, 2,500 years ago or 4,000 years ago in ancient Greece, for example, is as, um, I guess, uh, what would the word be? Um, it's just like a childhood memory is for you, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the people that are creating this type of thing have the ability to implant not memories per, like per se, but all of this type of thing. And it's the sorting function that, you know, natural, like the game of Go, right? It's like, here's all the substrates with the algorithm in the background and how it actually swells in the relationships that form, you know, are partially informed by the environment, the conditions, the people around. I, I love this. We do, um, you're going to have to show me how that works because we do strength finder testing with all our employees you could do this with any of those personality assessments or whatever but in this case you know everyone gets their five strengths and then we try and map that to kind of a structure of our organization but if we ran it through something like that and could produce a model that showed us like you know how or i don't know something to do with human interaction i think that'd be freaking awesome well i want to tell you that um, the technology that I was using was based off of a ready, readily available Google schema. So uh, I think, think of a dynamic model that was just, that, think of the model a little bit more dynamic. So yeah. the problem with workplace and personality assessments and testings is that you do, you have to come up with the predetermined guidelines. And then it's like, I'm in this category, I'm in yeah. this category. And, you know, humans work differently. Like, let's say we had an organization together, mm -hmm. we're all you know, working for the same consulting company. Um, and you talked earlier about the presence of that person coming into the room. So all of a sudden, Adam and Kate announced that they've just hired superstar Sally Jones, okay? And mm -hmm. now she comes in, well, my being in existence, my being may change in that group based off of who comes into that group. So, so much of it's relational and not as individualistic as we think. So it's the interaction between these working yeah, it's that have a... Totally. It's like my strengths, your strengths, her strengths. And then you have that fourth person, it's going to skew everything, right? That's why I would yeah. do it in a model like that. So I could like drop this person in and see what happens to my organization, right? I yeah. That. Or at least I can call it. I don't know. There's there's something there. I mean, I well, I think, uh, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, my intuition says to structure some activity of creative output as a result of the nodes that they see. Either based on blind alley or blind alleys, uh, based based on blind spots, or on, you know, because this this kind of data structure can be pretty revealing, and so mm -hmm. you know, you give the the individual the opportunity to go through it in in a, a fairly um, specific way, and now you have a way to map out creativity, right? And it and it can, it's the values most parent to the actual person who's actually receiving the instruction. Mm -hmm. So they're the one that can actually experience the assignments, but they can't really experience a nodal graph. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's about mm -hmm. mapping it onto something to say, here's where your knowledge is clustering right now. Here's where you've been able to develop. Um, and then reflect what, 
do you now, uh, do you find that your experiences are um, more valuable to society or the organization because you have this, uh, you, you know, that your, your, your map has gone in a, a particularly different way? You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Yeah, no, this could be relevant in so many applications. I like this. I think I'm gonna explore this a little bit in terms of my, I think it's a good visual to try and um, in our story anchor what we're trying to explain in terms of um, you know structured versus non-structured, disruptive humanity versus information, all these kind of things, right? Take all these big thoughts and then like anchor it in like grounded in some kind of visual that people can understand, right? I think maybe this is a cool one to explore a little bit. Yeah. So, so yeah, see where it goes. And like the project you're working on, you know, yeah. with the science fiction book, um, it does merge over into your work environment. My work environment just has to be the publishing agency and, you know, mm -hmm. to a very much lesser degree, the construction uh, architecture consulting. But, um, you know, this this is something that, you know, informs informs uh, our content creation. It's something that informs, uh, you know, some of my deeper, you know, philosophical thoughts based off of mm -hmm. relational databases. And I think that, you know, fundamentally, you're, we're a species. We're a you social species. We're a relational species. And so, to know that you've you've got this kind of a map, um, the the limit of that particular map is that it's based off of your famous, you know. Uh, authors, right? And yeah. it it doesn't it you know so it's a, it's a very limited one. But how influential can you know these significant people that we continually go back to, right? So, um, like for instance, Adam, are there some authors either in the science fiction genre or outside that you find yourself continually going back to? And that's really um, and before you answer that, I, I will say that I. I reduced the number from 25 to seven. I, I want to see seven for most people, uh, primarily because of some um, research done in, in color theory. Okay. And in color theory, there's, a, a, uh, oh no, this wasn't in color theory. Sorry, I apologize. Um, it has to do with a number that we can perceive. And um, there's some research that says that we can only look at seven things, look at them and know they're seven. Everything above seven becomes combinatorial, right? When I look at something visually, right. I can see, you know, two groups of four and I can conceive of eight, but up to seven, I can look at it and I can, you know, and we developed mm -hmm. a language for one to seven. And so you kind of put yourself on the hot seat a little bit and say, who are the people that mentally I'm actually really thinking about in terms of other authors or public intellectuals that you know, that I, that I refer to on a regular basis. And then what does that reveal about the 25 other thinkers that basically the, 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 the Google schema informs us about? And it's quite revealing, actually. That's, that's cool. I, I have noticed as I'm writing, I'll, I'll notice like, oh, this looks like uh, Jim Butcher. It's kind of like tongue in cheek, like whatever. And I'm like, oh, well, this part needs some Sanderson. It needs some like bigger world building, some like whatever. So I'm definitely recognizing some of my favorite authors, authors like bubbling forth, which is which is pretty cool. I think <laughs> it means I'm paying attention. <laughs> right? so, oh, that's that's great. Um, yeah, it's it's one of the milestones I think when I have uh, you know the 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 Sanderson um, entry on Wikipedia, right? <laughs> okay. no, well, well, no, but see, but let's talk about that in terms of you know everlasting life for a minute. Um, you know, we are bound up by information systems, even into uh, uh, you know into death, for example. So if you pass away, and you know, what's the what's the the internet um, fingerprint? I guess right. We talk about legacy or anything, but it, it you know there's there's kind of some you know, I, I actually gave a presentation on this last week to the wow. um, PMI Institute in Calgary. And the, the case we were making was for social media as an engagement tool, like in a business context. But the, the point was, I, I said, 
anybody can Google your name and something will come up. If you've been around long enough, you've you've won an award, you've gone to an event, you've done this, that, or everything. Something will come up about you that talks about who you are and what you did in your life. Doesn't matter who you are. If you're long around long enough, um, there is some story being told. So my point was, you may as well have a say in that, in what that story, right? Who do you want telling your story? I'm on trial for murder. Am I going to let you take the stand? Or do I want to go up there? And <laughs> that's you know, that's great. Extreme example to illustrate my point. But um, anyway, I was hoping that that made people pause and think, because not everyone really wants to be online or whatever. Let me let me know if I can give you some philosophical, poetic, uh, you know, I, I, I guess you call it Sanderson thinking, right? But um, mm -hmm. I refer to the, to the Google query as the Google Oracle. Yeah. Okay. And so way back in the day when you had, uh, you know, the Oracle of Delphi, right? Is it Alexander the Great would go there just to, you know, see what she says, you know? And uh, there's, there's a story of, um, I guess, um, maybe it was an accident of luck or something like that. But I, I think because of his look and his curly hair on the sides, they kind of looked like horns. Okay. And this somehow um, evoked uh, the image of, of, of a god, right? For So he kind of got, I mean, he had, he had a, a big ego anyways, but I mean... You know, and then and so the Delphi actually kind of reinforced that he was, you know, the son of God, actually. Right. And and so he was supposed to be the master of all um, of all all things on the land, basically. Right. So this is mm -hmm. kind of also in the tradition of the pagan tradition as well. Right. Now. What's really interesting, have you heard about the Battle of Tyre? I don't not think so. I'm guessing okay, it's E H Y R E something like that. Yeah, so I'll I'll pull up something on YouTube to show. Uh, we don't have to watch the whole thing, but um, yeah, if we search the Battle of Tyre. Okay, or it's called the Siege of Ta of Tyre. Okay, so I mean, this is easy. Something somebody can go back and 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 watch, right? Yeah. Siege of Tyre. And basically, there's the old city, and then there's the new city. And the the new city actually sits um, on a well. Actually, let's see if we can play this. Just to give you the okay. So I'm pausing it here. So Alexander, you can see he's right there, and he's mm -hmm. trying to get to this island, right? Yeah. And so what he does is he takes the rebel, the rubble from over in the older city, and he does a land bridge over here. Okay. So he keeps building up the land and eventually takes it. This had, had never been taken before. It was like impenetrable, right? And so anyways, he um, he did that. It's a it's like a a very monumental and and his historically significant battle. And it's really cool because if you go into Google Earth, um, you can actually see the, the, the remnants of the land bridge like it seems so exciting. It's like that was what Alexander the Great built oh, and cool. changed the geography of our planet. I'm going to you check can actually, that out. Right? You can actually look and see the remnants of that land bridge from Alexander the Great. And, you know, if you want to use metaphors for, you know, talking about building bridges, um, you know, that's it. I just I just love that story. I think that's 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 really great. Um, and so. Um, I don't know if my, I can't remember what my other point of it was, but, um, anyways, I was just, I think just making the point that, you know, there's this, this idea of, of, um, huh. yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It's, it's a full on, it's not an Island anymore. <laughs> it's not an Island anymore. And that was Alexander the great who did that. And, you know, when they say that he conquered the world, honestly, Adam, he really, like, he really conquered the world. I mean, Cool. You know, for 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 pretty much all intents and purposes. And then you think about, you know, what was the legacy that he left behind from a material sense? You can see on Google Earth, that's what was left there. But what does humanity mean? Well, everything else that that 
uh, um, on how the, the Hellenic tradition was transferred, integrated into Judaic tradition across anywhere where we conceive of what the West means, hmm. all came from, from that Socratic, Plato, Aristotle, and Alexander the Great. It was all that combination of, of people we, we could say working together, but it, it wasn't through one thread of time. It wasn't like a bunch of people came together and said, okay, how can we do this? It, um, you know, Socrates, it, you know, died and then Plato was continuing to live and then Plato died and Aristotle, I think lived, he lived a little bit longer, but still was a student of, of Plato. And then Alexander the Great was a, a student of you. Yeah, so it's the lineage of these types of things. And it's a very justifiable explanation for what I've heard you say before is like, what do you want to leave behind? What are your messages? What are your, mm -hmm. um, you know, what is your legacy? Right. And um, it's real big picture thinking. It, it's, it's not for everybody, but sometimes thinking in such broad brushstrokes, uh, gives you that perspective to think about, okay, what do I really want to, you know, do for that next big chunk of 10, 50, what do I want to contribute to, or, you know, this well, type of thing. Right? I think storytelling can be so great, right? Sometimes you can hide big thoughts in the story and, you, you know, I don't want to say trick people, but like people who would normally read that and be like, I'm not interested in thinking that hard today. I just want a book to read on the beach, right? You can sneak it in there. I just, I believe that it's possible to, you may find yourself thinking big thoughts without even realizing. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, anyway, I, I think that's that's why I enjoy reading. Yeah. So. So what's next for the book now? What's um you know we got we got in two weeks we're gonna reconvene again. Uh, leave it to you and Kate to decide who writes or whatever. But um, you know, just touch base with her. Uh, I'd love yeah, to see. Yeah. Let's see if we can get her. Uh, to show off some stuff next time. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, she's a very good writer. I, I, I was so impressed when she sat down and did produce that pod. Uh, the pace, the tempo, the whole concept of the jettison of it and being, I, I really think that's great. So I'd like to, cool. I'd like to see some, some more. Yeah, sure. we're going to move forward. Our hope is to accelerate it into December. You know, things inevitably seem to slow a little in December, although not showing signs of it yet but i would love i would love to just kind of have an hour a day to just work on this it doesn't happen but i would love that for that yeah. well you know what i mean i i might be around more too so hey bud i'm telling you if you guys feel like just send me a note saying hey can we jump on and record a quick hour because you know you're excited and you're you've yeah. got something cool and stuff then <laughs> okay all right this thing only has to propagate across the rocky mountains right so that's it right okay <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thanks, Dan. Okay. Well, that a little bit shorter episode today, but uh, yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in and uh, another couple of weeks, we'll record another one. So thanks a lot, Adam.